Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. This is a league of A's and B's. It's green and red and gold and black and blue. This is a league with two official languages and many unofficial languages. It's East versus West, wheat versus iron, love versus hate. This is a league where superstars are extraordinary and ordinary at the same time. It's a league of ice, of fog, of mud and wind. And for one Sunday in November, it's the nation's glue. This is a league as diverse as a country, a league of Jacksons and Kwongs, Johnsons, Moscas, O'Shea's, and Haji Razulis. This is his league, his league, her league, their league, and their league. It's my league, and it's your league. This is our league. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, it's Greg here and I got Scott. And this is our first podcast for the new year. Apologize. It's been it's it's kind of late. We're kind of late on it. But, uh, you know, how everybody how it goes. It's real world kind of gets in the way of, of all the fun. So um, so what we're going to talk about here at the very beginning is Scott, who was present at uh, the USFL press conference. And then afterwards, we're going to sit down with R.C. Christensen, who we're going to talk to about his new book called Border Boys, about uh, the early history of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and uh, their first uh, Grey Cup. So how's it going, buddy? Going good. How are you? Not bad, man. Not bad. It was a good interview with Ryan. It was. It was. And it's uh, good timing, too, with Winnipeg winning yet another Grey Cup title. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know what? Funny you should mention that. We never did talk about the current, you know, we just, we were so far back in the thirties and the twenties that we never kind of really brought that conversation full forward to the 21st century, but that's okay. Uh, yes. Ticats fan. I would just assume not talk about it anyway. So yeah, dude, man, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say the last time did we, I can't even remember. Did we talk prior to the gray cup? I think after? we did. Um, you know, I did honestly, it was a lot better game than I thought it would be. Oh yeah. Tremendously high hopes, but oh yeah, I was, you know, it looked, it looked for a while like the top cats are going to win it. So I was getting yeah. really excited. Well, but for, uh, you know, and people can criticize in that, but it was a good game. Oh, it was, it was an excellent game. It was a good way to finish the season. Um, yeah, no. Yeah. It was the way that way, the way, uh, the way a season should end. If you ask me, you know, if you ask me instead of a blowout, man, the game went down to the wire. Yeah, you always hope that championship games look like championship games. You know, for so many years, the Super Bowl was a blowout. It got to where really after you saw the NFC and the AFC championships, you were kind of done. You, see, you know, you yeah. knew the Super Bowl was going to be a, a wipeout. But, yeah, yeah. It, was, well, it was a we, good finish. Yeah, I mean, with the exception of that, the, the New York Super Bowl back when they hosted it at uh, up at the Meadowlands, I mean, we've been pretty fortunate with um, – Yeah you know, with the Super Bowl not being a blowout. And of course this year it'll be kind of nice. I'm, I'm, my pick for this year is the Rams versus the Chiefs. And I think a lot of people are probably leaning that way too. Well, since the Rams are my silver list, as far as teams I cheer for, I'm, I hope they're at least half of the Super Bowl. Although yeah. my God, I thought they were going to choke last week. That just, man, 
I'm uh, thinking, yeah. no, let's not have another Patriots Falcons situation here with Brady. So. Well, it was it was funny because my wife wanted to go to the symphony. So I'm like, okay. And I I would I didn't want to tell her, look, it's it's playoff weekend. I, I didn't have the heart to tell her. So I had the phone on. I had poor reception at Chicago Symphony Hall. And my wife's like, what are you doing? I go, just checking the scores. Well, fortunately, the symphony ended just in time for me to catch the last two minutes of the rate on the radio. And uh, so at least I got that. I mean, I got that. But then I came home and it's like, oh, I mean, I think uh, who was it um, on Rich Eisen show? Um, I can't remember who said it. He goes, but man, I needed to smoke after that first game. And then we go right <laughs> into the second game, you know? Just, just so much excitement. Yeah, it was just a great weekend. I mean, yeah. you could you couldn't script better games than oh, what no, happened. No, no, no. Which and, you know, I mean, it's it's funny. I mean, it, it, all the excitement. Not only people were excited, not only for the games, but amongst that subset of us, and we're part of that. A lot of excitement for the USFL promos and the USFL logos popping up on uh, the screen during these games and. Uh, so we've got the USFL coming up in April. And, you know, as I put out on Twitter, we are the only podcast that some had somebody on the ground at the press conference. And you were our guy. So uh, tell us about it, man. What was it like? Who, how many people were there? What, you know, give us a feel for, for what uh, you saw. Yeah, and- I mean, it, uh, it, it was at the, the stadium club, a protective yeah. stadium. Um, and it, it was packed. It was mostly, you know, civic leaders, but it was – Right. It was packed with a lot of, you know, Birmingham, Jefferson County uh, city leaders. And that's really news standpoint. That's mostly what the presser was about. It was just basically so Birmingham, Jefferson County could kind of take a victory lap. Right. Or for, you know, getting the league to to be the hub for 2022. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as far as major news that that broke there, I mean, you know, they announced that game would be the Stallions and Generals on April 16th. Um, but really, if you wanted actual news, you kind of had to get it after the presser. So, okay, um, you know, when it ended, Brian Woods was there. The, we all know who Brian Woods is. And the only questions that, that I wanted asked, which you know, they were during the press conference, because, again, it was just, hey, we're here. You know, let's thank the city leaders and they're going to yeah. thank us. But I wanted to know about rule innovations and compensation. And from, you know, Woods told me that it would be officially announced in a couple of weeks as as far as the rule innovations. But basically, they're going to be NFL rules. He said, except for a couple of minor deviations, which would be like for pace of play. And for me personally, that's kind of disappointing because, you know, we've talked about it when I see these spring leagues. I like the rule innovations, like right. what the XFL did in, in 2021. I loved. I thought that the no double those rules were pass. Well, just everything. I mean, just yeah. the, you know the way they did kickoffs and punts. Oh yeah, no, no, I know that. Tier. But the USFL, they're not going to bring. Uh, no, bring apparently, out the double. you know, apparently it's just going to be pretty straightforward. Just basically NFL rules, except for pace of play. So I guess we may have some ball placement or, or clock or something. So right, you know, that's that's slightly disappointing as far as compensation. He wouldn't say. He said that would get out in, in the next few weeks, but that they were currently negotiating with players. Um, and I'm just still curious about that because that's going to be that's going to be the first salvo fired. Because once the XFL finds out what the USFL is paying, yeah. then they can turn around and say, "Well, sure, this guy's going to make thirty grand, forty grand, or whatever. We'll pay. You know, we'll pay sixty grand." So that's I'm sort of interested in. You know, you go back to 2019 when the Alliance of American Football was formed. I remember thinking, well, they're jumping a year ahead of the XFL, so the XFL can kind of learn what worked and what didn't. And, of right. course, the AAF, you know, folded after eight right. weeks. And the XFL then took those lessons learned and it turned into a really good product until, you know, that fifth week and then the world changed. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If, you know, you you take the pandemic out of the out of the equation and they certainly make it through their first year you know yeah. what happens beyond that i don't know but they right i think they've done everything right um well i, I mean, mean it, you know and, oh go ahead i'm sorry no no i was just saying i mean and you know that's kind of the thing if if the usfl you know when they start in april if they finish their season they'll be the first domestic spring outdoor league to make it through an entire season 
since the original XFL back in 2001. Right. Um, you know, so. Well, would we include he, the TSL Spring League in that, though? I, you know, Could because we? that's not that's not professional football. They're, they're True, they paid, to, they know, paid to play. Yeah, it was more. Yeah, they paid to play. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of the I mean, I guess if you want to. You know, well, no, I mean, if you get technical enough, it was not professional football. But right. And two, it was honestly, I didn't watch it. Weren't their seasons really short, like maybe yeah. five or six yeah. games? Yeah. So if the USFL, if they make it from start to finish, they're going to have a 10 week regular season, one week of playoffs and the championship. So you're looking at 12 weeks. Yeah. Well, um, the other thing, too, that the USFL has going for it right now, and I really don't hear it mentioned much, is baseball is on a lockout and we don't know when baseball is coming back. Yeah. And, you know, and, and this is just me talking because I can't speak for for other people, but I, I know personally my interest in baseball has just plummeted. So I'm not even sure what difference. I mean, when I talked and it, you know, I've talked to other people and I think baseball is almost, I think Upton Bell, our, our friend has, has mentioned that baseball has almost become like a regional sport now. Yeah. And, you know, I just don't, I'm not sure that really matters one way or the other. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I think people that are interested in football. Right are going to watch it because that's basically one weekend where baseball is playing every day. You know, even yeah. if you like baseball, you can still watch it five times a week and then sacrifice it, you know, on yeah. Saturdays and Sundays. Yeah. So. Well, and that's true. I mean, and I think, you know, you got, you know, spring football has always competed against every other sport. Whereas in the autumn football doesn't really have to. Yeah. There's basketball and hockey going on, but those seasons are just kind of starting up anyway. And the meat and potatoes of the basketball and hockey seasons and baseball. I mean, everything kind of, so it'll be interesting. Um, what did you well, the think one of- that, to me? Well, to me, the, you know, just, just to get this out there, cause I just put it right at the end of the story after I covered it. Yeah. Maybe the biggest news, $10 tickets, 15 and under admitted free. You can't top that any, I mean, no, we're always talking about, well, they're competing for different things for your entertainment dollar. Right. You can't top that. You can't no. go to a movie yeah. for that. Yeah. You so can't. I, yeah. No. So now you've got mommy, daddy, Jethro, Jethro, May, they can all go to the game. And if Jethro, Jethro and Ellie May are 15 and under, it's free. So, well, and incredible. it'll be curious to see. Let's see if it works, obviously, because I mean, that's the key. It's proof of concept right now with the USFL. And, you know, I mean, let's face it, if it works for the USFL, I am guessing the XFL is going to pull out all stops to bring people in next year. But more importantly, is the CFL kind of paying attention to all this? Because, you know, you know, we've we, we, we've seen the, the number of empty seats in the stands in CFL games. So is the CFL taking notes and going to, like, okay, maybe we should do this. Um, yeah, and you know, this that's what's so odd, or well, maybe odd is the wrong word, but I mean, with this first season, the USFL being in a hub environment, yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not entirely sure how how hugely interested they are in attendance. Now, I do think, especially with cheap tickets and especially opening night, I think you could probably expect a nice crowd. Oh, yeah for the stallions and the generals now right. what crowds will be like two weeks down the road when or week Tampa seven. Bay plays in michigan or yeah you know week seven yeah it, it could change there but yeah in terms of the league and the stability you know you're there's no travel expenses there's none of right. that everybody's in one place so that right you know that's going to work to their advantage to that end in, in terms of reaching the finish line but yeah, yeah. you mentioned the xfl Aren't they supposed to start their season like in, in February, right after yeah. the end of the Super Bowl? So yeah. then we're going to get a jump start on the 2023 USFL in terms of grabbing players. Right. So, you know, that, that's kind of intriguing to me is that you're yeah. going to you're going to have kind of like perhaps a minor league bidding war, which right. I think is great. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the two, the way that the way their things are laying out in the calendar, say for next year, XFL, you got the NFL ending, XFL starting. There's going to be overlap. You know, it's, then the USFL starts getting going, and then the CFL starts getting going. And then we're so you're not seeing them directly competing except for that overlap period. So yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Um, but you know, it's like anything else. You and I have been down this road before, as you said on Tim's uh, you know, podcast over Good Seats Still Available. 
we've been through this before. So hopefully they've learned their lessons. And um, yeah, I mean, it's the, the analogy that I'm, I'm beating it to death, but I do like the analogy. It's kind of like NCAA tournament 16 seed against the one seed. You think right. it's never going to happen, but then finally it did. Yeah. So yeah, will this, def- you know, will this USFL or this XFL, will they pull off the right. 16 seed? You don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, all we're you can en- be is hope for the best. Yeah. And, and we're entering a new hopeful. age and obviously we'll, I'm sure we'll get in this discussion in later podcasts, but I think we're entering an age. I mean, this is 20, 2022 now. I mean, we live in the future. So you, technology plays a role in it. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, fan can, you know, we didn't even get into fan control football. And I still think that fan control football is actually farther along and seeing kind of the future of the sport, but who knows? I mean, you got, well, I'll let you in on a dirty little secret. I've never seen a fan control football league game. I'm sure it's I, entertaining or whatever, but I've just, it's just something that doesn't particularly interest me. For my, t- my take on it is, well, it's just basically arena football without anybody in the stands, but there's also that interact interactivity that comes along with it. And I just think we're, you know, kind of in the beginning stages and even over on, you know, uh, we talked about this and it's been a couple months ago now, but over on gridiron Japan on that podcast, one of the teams sponsored by IBM was, was experimenting with VR. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure from it, from what I've heard from people, it's, it's interesting. It's just one of those things that, for you know whatever's going on in my life i just haven't really stopped to yeah to watch it but you know I, as yeah. we've talked before I, anything that's as that's a nice business i want to succeed i want the people to get paid you know i want it to to work out for everyone so right, right. You know, more power to them well real quickly here we actually got a little breaking news in terms of football it just popped up on the computer here um the final two he- usfl head coaches have been revealed live on the herd which I never watch anyway because it interferes. I mean, Rich Eisen's on at the same time, so I'm not watching the. Herd. Yeah, I don't watch it either. Who are the um, Who are the two guys? I have no idea. It just popped up on the computer. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll let the guys over at the US the US the other USFL pod. We'll let the USFL podcast talk about those guys. And um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it it plays out and everything shakes out. And you know, between now and then, you and I will be talking hopefully a little bit more than what we have in the last month with everything going on in our lives. And, uh, you know, uh, at some point here, I'm going to be reaching out to our friend Upton Bell, and we will be talking about this very subject about, you know, the history of uh, failed, uh, failed, I get, how do I want to say this? The history of alternative leagues and kind of the pitfalls and somebody like Upton is the perfect person to talk to because he has seen it all. Oh, absolutely. I mean, here's the guy that took over what was the New York Stars franchise. Right. But one thing I, I do ask him, which I don't think we did last time, you know, the second year of the WFL, that was actually a different league doing right. business as yeah. the World Football League. And I, I'd like to get his take on yeah. that because I know there was, uh, you know, just with the reorganization and everything, that's that league, I, as you know, is just extremely bad getting to me. So, I, yeah, I would oh, love yeah. to hear him Yeah, well, we'll uh, definitely... get deep in the water talking about it. Yeah. Well, with that, with that said, yeah, definitely after uh, I wrap up, we wrap up here and uh, I will be reaching out to Upton, but before then everybody, Hey, stay tuned for our interview with uh, RC Christensen and talking about his book about uh, entitled border boys, which is a great history book on the CFL on Canadian football, not just at the CFL, but the early history of Canadian football. And it's available on Amazon, both in Canada and in the United States. And I've read it. It uh, a lot of detail, a lot of great history that I was not aware of. And he put his heart and soul into this book and it is well worth the read for anybody who loves football, who loves football history, loves Canadian football, and even loves American football. It's an interesting take on it's an inter- it's an interesting story about people who is Ryan, uh, as Ryan indicated, their story should have been told a, a much longer time ago, but he, you know, he, he's the storyteller and he dedicated the book to the, to the people in the book whose story he he's telling. And uh, it's definitely well worth the read for anybody listening. So with that said, 
Stay tuned for our interview with Ryan, and uh, be talking to you soon. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. This podcast is sponsored by Play Classic Sports Simulation Board Games, spelled with two A's, P-L-A-A-Y. Realistic board game recreations of professional football, hockey, baseball, NASCAR, golf, and more. They cover nine sports in all, with a tenth, basketball, coming in 2022. You can relive great sessions of the past, create what if matchups from different eras, and much more. It's fun. So, if you're into sports history, you should check them out. That's play with two A's, P L A A Y, classic.com. And don't forget to use the code S H N at checkout and get 10% off your first order. Hey, Ryan, thanks a lot for joining us today. And, uh, Hey, we're um, for people who are listening here. As we said in the earlier part, we're gonna we're talking today about uh, Ryan's great new book called Border Boys, which just came out. It's available on Amazon and anywhere really. I think Ryan, anywhere you can find it, find books, right? Um, well, it is available through extended distribution. Um, uh, uh, it's published by Amazon. Booksellers, uh, libraries can get it through through their distributors. I don't know where else it might end up. But it's okay. primarily Amazon. It takes about six to eight weeks to filter through the distribution system. So I would say that right now it's not available other than Amazon, but it should be eventually. Okay. All right. And how, let me ask you, how did, how did it come to be that you wrote the book? I know you explain it in your book, but if you could tell mm-hmm. everybody who's listening who hasn't bought the book yet, how the idea for the book came about and kind of the research project process of it. Okay. Well, um, yeah, so uh, about, I think it was in 2017, uh, 2017, I, um, determined that, Hey, you know, I live in uh, Fargo, North Dakota and Winnipeg is about as far away from Fargo as Minneapolis is from Fargo. And I'm a big Minnesota Vikings fan, but I'm also a big football fan. And I realized, Hey, I could start attending CFL games up in Winnipeg. Why not? So I went up to a, uh, a blue bombers game. And it was halftime. And, um, and actually, I didn't see this ceremony because I was out looking for beer. And I was, to be honest, I was a little disappointed because I was looking for Canadian beer and all they had up there was Budweiser. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but anyways, um, so I get back to my seat and my wife said, hey, they just put this guy in their ring of honor. And they said he's from, he played for North Dakota State University, which of course is in Fargo. And um, I said, oh, really? Who's that? Oh, some guy named Fritz Hansen. And yeah, they put him on his ring of honor. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. So I had already um, started writing articles for the Professional Football Researchers Association um, at that time. And so I thought, well, this might be an interesting topic. So um, I didn't know anything about Fritz Hansen at the time, how basically he was this superstar in Canadian football. And uh, I started looking into it. And um, suddenly I, I started running across another name um, because I was searching for the name Fritz, obviously, um, Bob Fritz. And Bob Fritz is a name that's really familiar to people who grew up in Fargo-Moorhead because there was a sporting goods store uh, in, in, in this area called Bob Fritz Sporting Goods. And I'm like, first of all, why am I running into this name Bob Fritz? And second of all, um, you know, what's going on here? And so I figured out they were on the same team 
in, in Winnipeg. And I thought, okay, there's a lot to find out here. And the big question in my mind was, why don't I know anything about this? So here I have grown up in this uh, Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead, Minnesota community. And these players are from North Dakota State University and Concordia College, which is in, uh, in Moorhead. And I don't know anything about this. Why don't I? So I, I just started investigating. And your book starts off. And what I loved about, about your book is you talk about the history of the of Canadian football prior to the advent of the CFL. And we're talking not just a few decades back, but we're talking to the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Can you give everybody kind of a brief? And, and I, Scott, I think, don't think we've ever had this discussion in any of our other podcasts where we talk about the early, early history of Canadian football. You yeah, know, we've usually started like in the in 60s after it officially right. became the Canadian Football League. But yeah, it would be interesting to sort of get the backstory when it was rugby union and, you know, just the early days. Well, sure. And so, um, yeah, so how did it all start? Well, obviously, um, it it was called uh, rugby, right, uh, er, early on, and it originally was rugby. So it was English rugby that came over uh, from England uh, to Canada. And over time, um, the rules evolved. And so there was various what they called uh, rugby unions throughout Canada. Um, and, it's, and of course, it started out in eastern Canada because, you know, that's just how the the country grew right through westward expansion right and so <clears throat> um especially in ontario was where um these uh unions formed and um and the the game migrated west it was kind of interesting because um you know in the 20s you know we got the roaring 20s there was a lot of a um, lot more travel um between the united states and canada that, um in the in the late 20s especially and um, there was also, you know, people um, uh, emigrating to, uh, to Canada from the United States. And so what was, and, and we're talking about the Western part of Canada. And so what you're getting then is this expansion of, of this rugby football, as they call it, into Western Canada, along with some American influences into Western Canada. And um, Western Canada, um, not on a consensus level, but there was a lot of people in Western Canada that wanted to see their version of football um, become more like the American intercollegiate game. And one thing that's, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, no, Scott, go ahead, go ahead. I say, you know, one thing, you know, in, in terms of your book and in terms of the history, a lot of people, I wonder, even realize that originally in football, whether in American football or Canadian football, it was a three down game. I think most mm -hmm. of us here in the States just, you know, think, okay, well, no, it's kind of odd that the EFL has three downs when it's a four down game, but really the Genesis was three downs, both sides of the border. Well, yeah. And actually what happened was, um, is, and there's no, I haven't been able to find any kind of direct connection between with how the influences, um, went across the border but there is the um the canadian game was the first to go to three downs for 10 yards because the the american game was three downs for five yards and back and back then it you know it was all these mass plays you know they just you know kind of almost like the old rugby scrum right where they're just kind of pushing their their weight against each other to get five yards and um and so in uh, Ontario, uh, they started using uh, three downs for 10 yards. And then um, in the United States, it was uh, when they decided after Teddy Roosevelt got involved after there were so many players that were getting injured and dying uh, from, from the way we were playing football down here. Um, he said that, hey, we need to make some changes. And in the American game, then we went to three um uh, three downs to get 10 yards. And we added the forward pass at that time. Um, and then at some point, I think um, it was, I think it was only six years later, I'll have to look back at my timeline, but the, um, 
they changed it to four downs for 10 yards uh, because they wanted to uh, they, they wanted to reduce the amount of punting in the game in in uh, in the American game, and so oh, that was the split. Then when we when the American game, they decided that they didn't want the games to be decided as much by individuals who can kick well, um, and and to be more of a team effort. I guess is it was the philosophy at the time. Then they went to four downs to get ten yards, and of course Canadian. Uh, football has still remained three uh, three downs for ten yards. And you also talked to, I mean, the 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 the, the rouge. Yeah. There's also <laughs> <laughs> right. Which you know, I mean, I think uh, especially after this past weekend watching NFL playoffs, would have been interesting if uh, how a how a rouge might have impacted a couple of those games. Well, yeah, and you you see, um, you know, you know, of course, we don't have film from way back, but you right. see. Um, you know, there's m- some more recent footage that you can like watch on YouTube where it's a tie game at the end and they're just, they're, they're doing um, uh, running drop kicks back and forth, trying to get that rouge at the end, at, at the end of the game on the final play of the game to try to win. So they don't have to go to overtime. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, for anybody. And I'm sure you have these conversations up there. And even though you're close to the board, let me ask you, you're close, pretty close to the border. When you talk CFL football, I mean, with Scott and I, when we talk CFL football down here in Chicago and Birmingham, people's eyes glaze over. What's uh, <laughs> what's it like for you up being that close to the border? Do you get yeah, the pe- same reaction? Yeah, people's eyes glaze over. Uh, you kind of find your your people, you know, in the community that also, you know, pay attention to CFL football and right. I have a buddy. I have a buddy who grew up in uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, which is much closer to the border. And see, back then, um, you know, we didn't have cable. Well, we did have cable, but it was still pretty early. But there was still a lot of broadcast television, and um, he would get Canadian broadcasts, you know, over the air. And so he would watch CFL football because it was it was over the air. And so, yeah. um, so we don't cut have that kind of same influence like we used to, you know, when we used to watch all that uh, over the air um, TV broadcast, you'd, you'd catch things across the border, but like you don't do it now. So, right. Well, I mean, you, you, all three of us, we grew up in that magical time where, I mean, you watched stuff over the air and even now looking back on YouTube and I'm kind of digressing here with our, with our topic, but we'll get back on. But when it comes to, you know, the, the love of the CFL, I mean, I learned how to love the CFL in the library and the box scores. Um, Scott, you know, he he remembers a time when they were actually, they did broadcast some CFL games. Um, Yeah, they were like trying, it was during the summer, they would be like truncated games. There would be like an hour's, you know, it would be uh, cut down to fill an hour time slot. And I was just so obsessed with football. The fact that there was football being played early in the summer which is fantastic for me. So I immediately fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm a late comer. I, I actually didn't start watching CFL football until I got it on ESPN plus, you know? And yeah, you're, and you're like <clears throat> me. I mean, too, in terms of really watching the games. Yeah. Until they started broadcasting them for, you know, NFL network ESPN, but yeah, ESPN plus, and that's, what's kind of cool right now about being with the CFL. It is gaining new followers down here in the States. Thank God with ESPN plus, and hopefully that's going to continue, obviously, for well into the future. But the one thing I find when I talk CFL football is, is with, with Americans, but even with Canadians, too, just about the rich history of the game and how it started. And you, talked, you talk about the rugby unions. Mm-hmm. And I know with that 1935 season, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers weren't part of an official CFL but they were part of a rugby union and what is how, what were the rugby unions and sure. If you could describe the rugby unions in general and mm-hmm. because I, when I was reading your book, I'm like, Oh, it, it reminded me very much of kind of college mm-hmm. divisions mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. just the layers. If you could, you know, if you yep. could kind of describe sure back then. So you have to, you have to uh, realize that back then, um, Technically, all of the teams that played um, football 
and they called it rugby, of course, um, was they were technically amateur. And so it, it the college teams and the club teams were all amateur teams, although there was this under the table paying of people, you know, um, on the club teams. I don't know anything about the college teams, if any of that might have went on, but there was some shenanigans there as well. But they were um, they were technically amateur. And so what would happen is depending, it was sort of a geographic uh, unions. Um, and so in Manitoba, they had, had the Manitoba Rugby Football Union. And then Saskatchewan had their own and Alberta had their own and, and, and British Columbia had their own. In the East, it was a little bit different. There was um, early on, there was Ontario and there was, was Quebec had their unions. And then there was, you know, the four teams that really rose to prominence that became what we call the big four. And they and they started the interprovincial uh, rugby football union. And so it was a little bit more of an overlap there. But um, so what happened was within these unions, you had both um, college and uh, professional or not professional. They, they actually were kind of professional, but you had the club teams, you had the college and the club teams playing within the same union to get the championship for that union. So for many years, um, you know, it was possible that a college team might, might uh, make it to the great cup. Oh, and also too, I mean, you had also military bases too up there that had teams mm -hmm. that competed too. And obviously, obviously in Winnipeg, up at Manitoba. Now I, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but when did, when did the military, bases start competing for the Grey Cup? Was that after, say, 1935 or well before the influence? Well, to say competing for the Grey Cup <clears throat> um, might, I, I don't think they actually got that far in, in, okay. in terms of, of, you know, but they, they were part of the unions. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, so in Manitoba, we had, we had the garrison team um, uh, as part of the union. Um, I, I'd have to look back at the history to see if a, a military team ever made it. But of course, looking ahead in during World War II, um, the, uh, the teams were replaced by service teams. And so in, um, in Peg, we had the Royal Canadian Air Force bombers instead of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Okay. And, and um, if I get this, I'd have to look at his uh, biography, but I think Bob Fritz, the, the coach for this 1935 team, um, he went on to be a player coach um, in the Royal Clinic Canadian Air Force Bombers team as well. So. Okay. Okay. And, 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 and you kind of jumping ahead here, um, your book obviously is, is talking about, the Americans who in, who came to Canada to play to play ball, and there's a term in there that I first time I'd ever run across it, and that is the Swede Belt. And yeah. I'll let you I'll I'll let you take it from there. Explain what the Swede Belt is and kind of the history, uh, the influence of uh, of, of y'all up there, uh, your, all all your fellow, all sure. your fellow Minnesotans and North Dakotans up there, and their influence on Canadian football. Sure. And I'm sure you hear sort of my accent here. I've, I've probably got an accent that almost sounds more Canadian than, than what you're used to hearing just because of where I live. But um, <clears throat> anyways, the Swede Belt, this is just simply an area stretching from uh, Wisconsin um, th uh, th west through North Dakota and then, you know, south, south a little ways, maybe down into South Dakota and Iowa and things like that. It's just an area where a lot of Scandinavian immigrants um came, uh, you know, during the westward expansion. And so it was just the population is, it, you know, was largely Scandinavian, but then there was a lot of Germans and things like that. But for whatever reason, that's a term that came out of the sports writers in Winnipeg that called it the sweet belt down here. And so um, that's, maybe that was more of a term that, that came out of, uh, you know, Canada or Manitoba or whatever. That's, that's what they called this area. So and um, in terms of football, you know, the, 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 the big schools that are mentioned in, in your book are mm -hmm. North Dakota State University, Concordia, Minnesota State University, which, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Minnesota State University a new name of the, of the college in Moorhead? Right. So there's, um, there's in Fargo, North Dakota and Moorhead, Minnesota, which sit 
as one big community and straddling the Red River um, in Minnesota and North Dakota. Okay, so in on the Moorhead side, you have Concordia College, and then um, Minnesota State University Moorhead, which at one point was called Moorhead State Teachers College, um, and then Moorhead State University, and now Minnesota State University Moorhead, and then North Dakota. Um, State University actually was called North Dakota Agricultural, Agricultural College until I believe the late 50s. And so, um, but they, as I explained in the book, they never, the students didn't like the name because they felt it was very, it was sort of pinning in what the, what the college really meant because they did more than just agricultural studies there. So, um, so they, everyone just called it North Dakota State. Okay. And um with well, Minnesota. When I see Minnesota State, I always think uh, the the TV show Coach, and I was like, yeah. "Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah." Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, they're not the Screaming Eagles. It's like, oh no. And then I read <laughs> a little of the history. I'm like, oh, that explains it. That explains it. Yeah. Um, but when it came to when it in your book, I mean, Border Boys is about really about four guys. Robert Fritz. Uh, main, it, mainly about those four guys. And yeah. then it gets into the, gets into the 1935 season for the Winnipeg. Yeah. Yeah. So if yeah. you could tell us a little bit about each of the guys, uh, mm-hmm. each, 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 each of the players and, mm-hmm. and kind of their background. And sure. also too, there's also an individual in your book and who brings, who kind of brings all these guys together up North. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the book introduces you, um, uh, actually to a couple of coaches as well. So you, you get to, you get to meet the, um, the coach for North Dakota state university, which his name was Casey Finnegan and coach for Concordia college, which was Frank Cleave and both of them had, you know, they they have interesting backgrounds, but anyways, um, at Concordia college, uh, we meet, uh, Bob Fritz and, uh, he's the, he's this big fullback who, is um, from International Falls, Minnesota, and he actually played high school basketball with Bronco Nagurski. So he um, uh, he knew Bronco, but of course Bronco uh, actually left International Falls in pursuit of playing uh, football. I think at Bemidji in Bemidji High School, and and then I don't know some eligibility came up or whatever. But anyway. Bronco it was is only one grade level older than Bob Fritz. And so it was kind of um but Bob Fritz was sort of a a latecomer to football. He he joined uh Concordia College freshman team in 1929. Um and then he I think it must have been financial difficulties because that actually just comes up later that he had did have financial difficulties staying in school. So he was only there for the fresh his uh fall semester in 1929 and then he didn't make it back to Concordia until 1931 um and then when and then because eligibility rules changed over the course of the time he was at Concordia he did actually end up playing four varsity seasons for Concordia so he was a five-year player there and um and he was um you know like three years older than than all the rest of the guys um who graduated around the same time and so on the other side of the river then at North Dakota State University, you had three guys uh, come from different places um, onto this team that ended up on the Winnipegs. Uh, one of them is uh, named Herb Peschel. He comes from Wapaton, North Dakota, and he was on a, uh, a football team down there that, you know, back then they didn't have official state champions, and but, you know, they sort of declared themselves state champions, kind of like, you know, the way it used to be in football or college football, right? And so that team did really well in outscoring their opponents and all that. And, um, and he was on that team on the line and he ended up being a, a lineman in college and for the Winnipegs. Um, and then you had an individual named uh, Bud Marquart. His real first name was Wilbur, but he wanted to go by Bud. Uh, he was a really good basketball player. Um, and uh, he was an all state center in Minnesota. Uh, and, he um, he did play basketball at NDSU um, as as well. Actually, I think they might have won a conference title and all that, but I just don't go into that part of it. Um, and 
but he played he played end uh, at NDSU, and of course he played end for the Winnipeg's eventually. Um, and he he also did some punting, but his main thing is he's really quick, um, and he could get down the field for and, and as as a gunner, right? He would he would cover uh, returns. And then, but the premier guy uh, from North Dakota State University that's talked about in the book, his name is Fritz Hansen. And he's from Purim, Minnesota, which is near a town called Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. And if you know anything about uh, um, Minnesota Vikings football, um, Adam Thielen is from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Um, and so I had him on, uh, I had him on a few of my fantasy teams. So I know. Oh, him well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Fritz Hansen is from Purim, Minnesota. Um, you know, I, I didn't, there, there was sort of like later talk about him having scored 11 touchdowns in one game. Um, I would, it was, I wasn't able to find like, um, concurrent accounts of that game or anything, but later it was said that he had scored that many and it's perfectly believable, um, because, uh, the way their team just outscored everybody that year by just a tremendous amount of points. And, um, and then once you see him get to college and then of course up in Canadian football, it's totally believable that he might've scored 11 touchdowns in one game in high school. Um, and so Fritz Hansen was this little, um, uh, a little halfback. And, um, and so he was really hard to tackle just because, um, it was, it was hard to get, it was hard to, you know, get at his legs. Right. And cause he's just so short and he would, um, you know, he'd run for 10 yards and it would take him 30 yards to get there, you know? So, cause he was, he was, uh, going, um, uh, you know, left and right across the line, uh, uh, to, to, to get places and just eluding people. But what he was really good at was, uh, returning punts. And w- once you get to the great cop, then you realize, um, just how important that was that he was such a good return man. Right. And obviously special teams, spe- were special teams that much more important back then than they say they are now, even though they're really, really important now. But special teams back then, it seemed to me, just in my reading of your, not only reading your book, but just kind of knowing the history of the game, that Mm -hmm. special teams, you know, that's where you make or break the game. Yeah, well, there was a lot more punting back then. And there was there was a lot more punting on even first down, um, especially in in Canadian football. There was there was much more punting. I mean, they would sometimes they would receive ball and then they would even they wouldn't even run a play. They would just instead of returning the ball, they would do the running kick and just kick it back, you know? Right. And, and so, um, the quick kick. yeah, the quick kick or, you know, the, the, the running drop kick or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, and so they, so special teams were really big. And, and one of the, the things that you saw a lot more of was blocked punts. Um, and especially if they got backed up to their end zone, right? right. Uh, blocking a punt and recovering the ball for a touchdown or forcing a safety or something like that. And so Herb Peschel, in this book, he doesn't get as much love as others because linemen, right? You just don't have as many opportunities to mention what he did. But he did actually recover, um, you know, uh, uh, a, 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 I don't want to say several, but he's recovered a few um uh, blocked punts. And I think he was part of those blocking of the punts, um, during the course of his college career. And he was key also for the Winnipeg's, uh, that first year on, in some of those special team situations. So, and, uh, back then was the book and I mean, I'm sorry, was the ball different back then? I mean, I think it was, but was the Mm -hmm. ball that they use different than the one, obviously than we use now during, the time that this period that this um, book covers from, um, I mean, it covers a lot earlier, but basically right. the, meat, the meat of the book is 1931 to 1935. Yeah. Um, during that time, the ball did change uh, size. Okay. Um, and so in, in other words, it became, you know, uh, skinnier and longer okay. and, and, and on both sides of the border. Right. So, um, so it wasn't just in Canada. So um, that's one of the, the things about this book that, um, you know, it took a lot to, to do the research and, and, and to figure this out. But this was a really key time in both Canada and the United States in terms of rules changes in order to make 
the game that we understand it now today, because, um, you know, in 1929 is when uh, the Canadians started experimenting with the forward pass. That was 23 years after the American college is, you know, adopted the forward pass. And so it was quite a stretch there. And, and then, so they experimented with the pass for a couple of years. And then in 1931, they decided, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take on the forward pass. But then at the same time, even so in the early thirties, um, the, even the American college game and coincidentally with the, the Canadian game, which, which wanted to mimic the American college game, at least in the past rules, to some extent, there was, you know, penalties and turnovers involved with, for just simply not completing a pass. So if you threw an incomplete pass, it, it might result in a penalty or might result in a turnover, depending on the, whether you were throwing it into the end zone or, or if you missed out in the middle of the field or whatever. Um, it wasn't until um, like, uh, I can't remember what year, if it was 33, 34, but one of those years, finally, American inter intercollegiate game finally dropped those penalties for those incomplete passes. And that really opened things up on the American side. Yeah. And, and, it, and reading all that, because, I mean, you do a great job. You go into depth in terms of – and actually, for a little while there, I don't know, I think maybe it was because I was reading it late at night. I had to go back and reread it because I'm like, did I make – did I get all of that? Because there was just so much there that yeah. had changed over the course of a short period of time, which, you know, kind of talking about, what um, you know, you and I are both, you know, love playing simulation board games, which, mm -hmm. you know, because of all the rule changes – everything makes it hard to compare eras obviously oh, yeah. so and that's what i found fascinating in your in your book uh because i haven't really read that in other canadian canadian football history that they, they do go into that in some canadian history books but usually the ones that i've read obviously talk about from 1959 forward mm -hmm. whereas you're going back to the very beginning and explaining kind of how everything came to be and how you know, the divergence, you know, starting from, you know, the 19th century and then the divergence and the, and then you go into, you know, up to 19, up to the 1930s. So with that said, you know, your book is about Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And if you could explain to people, because something people may not know is, you know, we talk about, you know, when we're comparing, you know, lately, and you know, is that a lot of the talk has been about the XFL and the CFL merging. And mm -hmm. during that conversation, there's always a talk about, well, you know, American teams have played Canadian teams back uh, yeah. before. But what people don't realize is American and Canadian teams were playing each other well before the 1950s mm -hmm. and 1960s. Mm -hmm. And that's what your book you know, talks about, and I know, you know, looking, I pulled up here just a, as a refresher here. Um, there's been a lot of exhibition games played north and south of the border between Canadian teams and American teams. And can you tell us the, the kind of the history, how that all started way back when, specifically, you know, as it relates to Winnipeg and, mm -hmm. and, and the area where you're from? Sure. So there was um, early on in there were some uh, games between Winnipeg and um, uh, University of North Dakota. And um, those games, and actually right before this book starts, there were, there were um, a, a, some games, I think maybe 28, 29, and, 20, and 1930, before the, the start of the book. There was some, and that's all shared in the introduction. So right. I, guess it, I guess it is in the book. But anyways, before chapter one, I talk about... Um, the games between Winnipeg, uh, some teams in Winnipeg and University of North Dakota. And those games were more of, hey, let's try this out. Let's let's play these games. And they would play, you know, half American, half half Canadian rules uh, just to see what it was like. I, I'm guessing. Right. Just it was sort of on a lark. Right. Um, <clears throat> but then what happened, though, is in Winnipeg, um, you know, when we start the book in 1931, um, uh, we had um, 
at the Winnipeg Rugby Club, which had just renamed itself from the Winnipeg Tammany Tigers. And that's important because the Tammany Tigers had actually competed in a great cup at one time um, and lost. But um, so there's that history there. Um, I'm not sure if the Blue Bombers recognize that as part of their history, but as far as I can tell, it certainly is. It seems like they just renamed themselves. Um, and they, um, <clears throat> So there was the Winnipeg Rugby Club. There was the St. John's Rugby Football Club, which was actually the oldest um, still operating rugby uh, football club at the time. Uh, there was the University of Manitoba, uh, the varsity team there. Um, and then you had the, uh, we, you didn't right away have the military service team, although there were over time different military service teams that came up. But um, what happened, and over the course of just a very short period of time, and I think the Great Depression had something to do with it, but the, all of those teams ended up merging into simply the Winnipeg, uh, uh, the Winnipeg Club. Okay. So, and, and they called themselves the Winnipegs. And um, <clears throat> so what happened was then they didn't have anyone to play because the University of Manitoba suspended uh, their uh, operations for football for, in a couple of different seasons that's covered in this book. And in order to find competition, they had to look south of the border. They just didn't have anyone else to play in Manitoba. And, you know, it wasn't too far to have um, University of North Dakota, other places like Mayville State University, Jamestown College, uh, you know, these uh, even uh, North Dakota State School of Science, which is down in Wapata, North Dakota, have them come up and play because um, it they were close, so they could they could they could do that. Or Concordia College played up there um, several times. And so, which rules did they use? So they whenever they played um, whenever they played in Winnipeg against the Winnipegs, it was always a half and half game, and so they would play half American and half Canadian rules. Okay. Um, but there was the one season there that the University of Manitoba brought back their football program and they went um, whole hog American football. So what they did is they hired uh, that coach from the University of Minnesota. He had played at the University of Minnesota. His name is Wally Haas. And he came up there and and when he when he showed up, there was a huge turnout for football at, at the University of Manitoba. And they scheduled games uh, against American colleges and played by full out American rules, American intercollegiate rules. Okay. And in turn, you know, I mean, up in Manitoba now, is there any, when it comes to the rugby union back then, is there any remnants left over from the rugby union now that you're aware of up and other than the blue bombers, obviously? Oh, did those does, leaks kind of, yeah, did those yeah, leaks kind of fade away? I guess I don't know. That happened later that I haven't okay. really looked into. So, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. You know, you know, it's really, I, I don't know exactly why the St. John's club folded because, you know, they were the longest, they were the most successful before yeah. they folded. They were, I think several years in a row, they were in the, um, in the Western semifinal against uh, Regina. And, um, and then all of a sudden they just weren't there anymore. They just didn't exist. And it sounded like there was some inner internal turmoil there. And so then Winnipeg ended up absorbing their team. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned Regina. I mean, the Rough Riders do, mm -hmm. do uh, appear rather early in your book, which I kind of liked uh, even Rough Rider fans, I think are going to enjoy reading your book, mm -hmm. um, you know, for as much as that rivalry is, it's, it's, it's when it comes to football history, it's, it's nice oh. to, uh, there's just such a rich history up there, which, you know, you know, Scott and I know, but a lot of football, even fans can't just don't understand how rich the history of football is up in that part of Canada. Well, and, and the rivalry it's, you know, the, you know, Regina was actually the, the, the team, of the West for many, many years, they were the team that was competing in the Grey Cup all the time, right? Right. And and um, and so even in Manitoba, if you were if you were a rugby football fan, you were kind of a you were you were a you were a Regina fan, you were a Rough Riders fan because they were the good team, right? They were the and so Winnipeg had 
it had to work against their own, you know, potential fan base to try to, you know, get interest in their own team there in Winnipeg. Yeah. So, so, um, but at the same time, anytime Regina played Winnipeg, then of course, then the homers would come out and, and, and there would be some, um, uh, some rivalry there. And, um, and even, you know, one of the things that's relayed in the book is when Regina played St. John's, uh, I think it was in a Western semifinal and, and they came to Winnipeg and Regina forgot their uniform. Yeah. That's and, I was it, thinking about right, that. Right. And, and, and Regina, no, I think they were black and red is, was their color at the time. Yeah. And, and so, and the funny thing was at the time, the Winnipegs who were not playing that day, cause it was the St. John's club that was playing the Winnipegs at that time, their color was green and white. And so what happened was Regina in order to play the game, they needed you know, uniforms or whatever. So they played in Winnipeg's green and white uniforms. And so if you just think about just the colors involved, uh, the, the rivalry between Regina and Winnipeg and, yeah. and the idea that they're wearing Winnipeg's colors and then they beat St. John's with, while wearing Winnipeg's colors, you would, it just makes you want to grind your teeth over with a, you know, the potential, you know, feelings involved with that game. Right? Oh yeah. And it just tells you just how deep that rivalry run, you know, runs where, um, and it's, I'm curious to, you know, it'd be curious to make, take a poll among Winnipeg and, and, and Rough Rider fans. Um, do you know where the green and white came from? I mean, and that's <laughs> what I loved about your book. It's like, I did not know that. Like, that's <laughs> awesome. And, but then I got to thinking, um, and I, maybe Joe Pritchard's watch, re, re, I'm sorry, maybe Joe Pritchard, good friend of mine who has a podcast, um, the Rouge White uh, Blue podcast on the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming Joe knows this little tidbit of fact because uh, <laughs> Joe is like you, hardcore uh, Winnipeg Blue Bomber fan. And, uh, but I saw that and I kind of smiled. My wife's like, what are you smiling about? I go, I learned something new today. It was right when I started reading the book. So, um, so talking about the blue bombers and their history, and let's talk about that first championship, that first gray cup. Mm -hmm. yep. And I know, and this is where, you know, I know the first five games that the Winnipeg team played were exhibition games. Um, it, that, that season. Yeah. Um, were they, were uh, they exhibition games? Because I know they played south well, of the border quite well, a few right, games. Right. When they played teams that were not in the Manitoba Rugby Football Union, right? right? Th those games were exhibition. Okay. Right. Now, did they count those? Was it kind of like the early NFL? Or did those games count in the standings or count for anything? Or was no. It just... No. So basically, the only, the only games that counted were the games that they played against uh, the winner. Winnipeg Victorias. Okay. Uh, the, the Winnipeg Victoria uh, Football Club. And so that was an interesting um, story with that too, because that club had been dormant for a few years. And uh, there was a gentleman who, um, his name was Fred Ritter, and he, he actually was part of the founding of the Regina Rough Riders, this Fred Ritter, but he he actually had gone to, I think he was a coach or a player or both down in Princeton. And, and he came back and, and he lived in Winnipeg and he was running some of the, the, the junior level um, uh, rugby football. And he, because the Winnipegs needed a, an opponent and because in his position about foot American players, you know, uh, was that, that, they shouldn't be importing these players up into Canada. He restarted the Winnipeg Victoria football club for that season and basically filled it up with former Winnipeg's players, you know, the ones that were, that were cast off um, and, and were replaced by American imports. And so, um, and so then that season, it was the, uh, the Winnipeg's versus the Victoria's. And of course the Victoria's didn't have a chance. So. Right. And if you could lay out for everybody how the American special, you know, Bob Fritz, Fritz Hansen, um, and Bud, and I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm horrible pronouncing his last name, and yeah. Herb Peschel, how did they come to, to be on the Winnipeg team and contribute to the championship? Because that's, that's the meat and potatoes of your book. Right. And so um, they got to the team because, see, Concordia College had over – the course of this book played up in Winnipeg a couple of times. 
and Bob Fritz was on that team. And Bob Fritz um, became sort of a fan favorite up there because he was he was just this natural born leader on the field. And um, and so when it came time for uh, and we haven't talked about Joe Ryan at all uh, uh, yet. Right. But Joe, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. Joe Ryan was the manager up there for the Winnipeg uh, team. And he's the one that that really pushed all of the all of this change up in Winnipeg uh, and 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 you know, to, you know, towards Americanization and, to, and, and, and towards more success and, and at, at, at the gate and everything. But anyways, um, when it came time, when they saw how well Regina was doing, <laughs> um, they decided they needed more Americans because in fact, everyone thinks about how Winnipeg has, you know, oh, they went out and got Americans, then they won the cup. Well, actually Regina was doing it first. They were. They actually had more of the Americans, um, uh, at least the most talented ones uh, at at that point, um, before Winnipeg did. And and what Winnipeg did in 1935 was a reaction to that. And so when uh, Joe Ryan, having you know, he knew who Bob Fritz was, so he came down um, either to Concordia or maybe he went to International Falls. Who knows where he went? But he he tracked down Bob Fritz and said, "Hey, we want you uh, to be up here." And he said, and then also asked him, you need to help us find some other guys. And so Bob Fritz, having played for Concordia against North Dakota State University, and of course, living in the same community, these guys, they would play all kinds of other sports besides their college sports. They, you know, they played hockey and hockey leagues and they played right. in basketball leagues. They knew each other. Right. And so Bob Fritz um, introduced um, Joe Ryan to Fritz Hansen. And then Fritz Hansen said, well, hey, what about Bud and what about Herb? And, you know, so um, so they ended up bringing those guys up. And then, of course, they weren't the only Americans up there uh, on that team that were big contributors. One of the one that we really need to mention, and of course, he's in the book, is this Bert Oha, who um, he had played for Minnesota. And he would he ended up being Winnipeg's line coach in 1935 and kind of made all the difference uh, in the world in terms of line play. And he was with that team, the Minnesota All-Stars, that's mentioned in the book. He was the coach of that team when they went up and played the Winnipegs. Uh, and so he ended up coming up there. And there was another individual there that was on the Minnesota All-Stars. His name was Pete Summers. He's from International Falls, and Bob Fritz knew who he was. And, 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 and of course, Bert Oha knew who he was. And they brought him up to be the bench coach during the 1935 season. Um, and... But, you know, one thing I don't want to discount here is the is the contributions that were made by the Canadian people on that 1935 team, the players, because you had dynamite kid Eddie James on that team. And he had come back from breaking the same arm twice, you know, to play in that 1935 season. And he was a big contributor in that season as well. Um, and then also they had that young little phenom from. University of Manitoba named uh, Tubber Kabrinsky. Uh, his, his first name was Morris. But anyways, um, he was a big contributor on that 1935 team as well. And then you, and then you had that longtime stalwart named Rosie Edelman. Uh, Lou Edelman was his, Lou was his first name. And he went, he played with the Tammany Tigers back uh, when they played in their great cup game before they even became the Winnipegs. Um, and, and so, I mean, there is there's a rich history there of of the winning players and i tried to bring in as much of that as i could um but you know um i was i just had more available to me obviously from from the 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 players uh, uh from ndsu and concordia to be able to speak about them but i tried as much as i could to get information in about those canadian players um and then you also had that lou mo uh born louis mogolovsky um and he was just this big uh, he was, you know, throwing beer kegs around, full beer kegs around at the uh, at the brewery up there in Winnipeg, and and one of the uh, uh, Winnipeg the Winnipeg coach at the time, Carl Cronin, sees him and, and try and tries to even cut one of those himself and couldn't, and he's like, okay, I need this guy. So you know, there, there's there, there's just there's just so many players, uh, and then I mean, even you know, like the forgotten ones. There's a a guy named. You know, he he contributed a little bit to the team that year, but he was on the team in 35. His name was Nick Pagonis. And 
he was sort of a late comer in 1935 to the team because he was up there at a college uh, in Winnipeg. They brought him on. Um, I don't think anyone uh, knows that, or I don't know if he ever shared the fact that he played for this team with anyone because he actually played college football after that. He went back uh, to, to the States and had a college football career. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of this whole wild confluence of all these different people on this team. And I know I haven't mentioned them all. Um, and one of the things I do in this book is I don't ever, I don't ever, uh, try to foreshadow what's going to happen. I just try to bring in as, as many of these, these names that make that, that, um, are meaningful in some way. And then the idea is by the time you get to the end of the book and you read the 1935 blue bombers season, you're like, Oh, that guy, and that guy, oh, wow, they're on the team. Okay. And, and, and it all sort of comes together that um, it was all these sort of strands led up to this great victory for the, uh, for Winnipeg. Yeah. And so they, they won, they won the, the, the province. So then they went to the playoffs. And of course their first opponent is the Rough Riders. Yep. And so if you could tell us kind of that playoff run in terms of, you know, kind of get, any, the stories behind that playoff run and, you know, what got them to, and, and I don't remember off the top of my head here, but when they played the gray cup, was that played in, where was that played? Was that the gray, played in? The, the gray cup was in Hamilton. So that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So once they, you know, clinched the Manitoba rugby football union title, which was not, no, not hard. Right. Um, then that year it was when actually it was Winnipeg's year to host is turn because they would alternate, you know, whether it was Man Manitoba or Saskatchewan would be the host. So Re Regina came to Winnipeg uh, to play that Western semifinal. And um, it's really interesting because one of the, uh, the members, one of the st star halfback and Regina was Ralph Pierce. And Ralph Pierce played for the University of North Dakota. And, and Hansen, who played, Fritz Hansen, who played for Winnipeg, he played against Ralph Pierce multiple times when, when NDSU would play University of North Dakota. And so here we have this <laughs> Regina versus Winnipeg rivalry going on in Winnipeg. But under the covers, you've got Hansen versus Pierce, right? And so, um, and, and and so, and, and just and not just Hansen, but Bud was there, and 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 Herb were there from North Dakota State, and so he had sort of these uh, rivalries from America that were brought up into <laughs> in Winnipeg, right, uh, uh, for that Western semifinal. So then they they uh, the Winnipeg beat them, and then Winnipeg hosted Calgary. And and because uh, it was Winnipeg's turn to host, right. so um, Calgary came in, and their coach was Carl Cronin, and Carl Cronin was the same guy that in 1933 brought brought this same Winnipeg club, not with without the without all of these new Americans, but brought this same Winnipeg club um, to play the Toronto Argonauts, and and wowed the crowd in in Toronto. Uh, you, you'll remember that from the book where Toronto was actually the fans are rooting for Winnipeg, right? They're, they're rooting for Winnipeg to win, but here it is in Toronto and it's the Toronto Argonauts who are playing. Uh, it was kind of a different fan uh, uh, dynamic back then, I think, but um, they, uh, uh, they, so they, they played Carl Cronin and the, and the Calgary, they were renamed the Bronx then and um, the, uh, and Calgary lost. And so um and so then that was the Western semi, or excuse me, that was the Western final. And so really interesting up through all the way through the Western final, Winnipeg never played in a away game. Every game was in Winnipeg. And, and so that's a real interesting situation. Um, and then after that, um, then they, one of the things, it was sort of a trick. The East was trying to get them to play a play in game into the gray cup, right? Like they had done in 1933, they ended up having to play Toronto as sort of a, a gray cup semifinal. Oh, uh, okay. Play in. And, and the, the CRU, which was basically Eastern team dominated was trying to get them to do that again. 
And Winnipeg said, no way, we, we, earned, we earned the right to play in the Great Cup, so we're just going to wait. So what they did then is they went to Detroit um, and Detroit, Michigan, and they uh, used that as their training ground uh, for a while. And, um, and they, they, they played one sort of uh, pickup game against a college, Assumption College, uh, in, um, uh, oh, across the, uh, across the river there over in Windsor. Canada. Yeah. Windsor. Yeah. So they, they played, um, they played assumption college and, um, and they looked terrible when they played them, of course, but it had been a long time since they actually played any games. Cause right. they, had, they had to wait a whole month before they would play Hamilton tigers in Hamilton. Um, and then during that time, while they were in Detroit, they went to a Detroit Lions game and Bob Fritz while well, the whole crew was there but Bob Fritz witnessed a play that the Detroit Lions made and said huh I think we could do something like that and he drew up a play and that play ended up being two of the touchdowns in the Grey Cup that year oh wow wow hmm. wow yeah. I did not know that yeah yeah so that was uh it was, it was basically a, um, I mean, I read in your book, but off the top, it's one of those details that I'm like, yeah, yeah I completely forgot about it. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a play where it, um, it involved a pump fake, which right. maybe at that time there wasn't a whole lot of pump fakes going on back then. Right. right? So it was a pump fake. And then, and then it was, then he, you'd fake that you're going to run the ball. And because, and then the defense, you know, these defenders are not defending the pass anymore. So they start coming after you because you're running the ball. Yeah. But then you actually throw the ball to the guy that you originally. Yeah. Uh, intended to throw the ball to, and they did, they actually did a variation on that play twice during the great cup and, 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 and scored twice that way. Okay. And then kind of the aftermath with, with the team, they won the, the great cup and then kind of what happened with the squad. I mean, um, with the players, I mean, kind of where did, where did things go from after the championship? Um, well, after the championship, some of the guys, you know, they, a lot of them stuck with the team, if that's what you're wondering, but, um, you know, as far as like getting home from the great cup, well, no, in terms of, I mean, they're, how long do they stay with the, the bombers and kind of what, you know, in terms of, uh, their post career where uh sure you know, what happened yeah. with all of them okay well um bob fritz okay so um he was with um the winnipeg rugby club from 35 to 37 so he okay. wasn't there for very long he sort of fell out of favor because um you know they weren't winning as much right as they had been and yeah. then he went and played for the edmonton eskimos from in 38 and 39 and then he was, and then he was also with the uh, Winnipeg uh, Royal Canadian Air Force Bombers uh, okay. d- during World War II. Um, and then he came back down. He had a, um, he actually um, coached at the University of Alberta for a couple of years, um, and then he came back um, to uh, Fargo Moorhead down here and and lived lived here and o- opened a sporting goods store. Mm. Um, uh, Fritz Hansen, um, he he actually won the Lionel Conacher award. And of course we haven't even talked about Lionel Conacher and I go into no, the book yeah. on all <laughs> <laughs> about that whole escapade. That's whole interesting thing, but he won the Lionel Conacher award um, for the male uh, Canadian athlete of the year. And um, you know, he's in the Canadian football hall of fame because he played uh, um, with Winnipeg all the way until 1946. Um, and uh let's see he played with winnipeg from until 46 and then he was with the stampeders for a couple of years and he was involved with multiple great cups and i'd have to sort of correlate my data to figure out which great cups he was all involved in um bud marquart uh he played for the winnipegs and or excuse me the blue bombers in 1936 they started calling them the blue bombers um he played with the played with them through 41 um, and then he, he, he also played basketball with the Winnipeg Toilers up there. Um, and then he, uh, and he just lived in Canada, uh, and worked for Hudson's Bay company. And then Herb Peschel, he played, uh, through 1941 with Winnipeg. Um, and then, 
and he he served in World War II, and then he 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 came back down uh, to uh, and lived in Minnesota across the river from uh, Wapaton or across the border from Wapaton. So, so, um, so yeah, so those four guys, uh, you know, they two of them, uh, two of them, yeah, two of them stayed in Canada, and two of them came back. Um, and you so it's it's an interesting thing around here in Fargo. I tell people this story, and it's like they're hearing it for the first time. Cause just like for me, it's like, what Fritz Hansen? are you kidding me? This guy's in the hall of fame and I've never heard of this guy and people around here, they just don't know about him either. And the only thing I can think of is the guy went to Canada and he never came back. Right. <laughs> so, well, so are they even honored? I mean, do they have rings of honor at Concordia in North Dakota state? Well, they do have, yeah, they have an NDSU hall of fame. And of course, you know, they're, they're all three of those guys for, from NDSU are in their Hall of Fame. Okay. Concordia has a Hall of Fame. Bob Friss is in their Hall of Fame. But, you know, this was quite a while ago now. And, right. Thing, you know, time passes and you just sort of forget about these things. But um, even so, I mean, it's, you know, I think it, you know, all of his greatness after college was in Canada. So people yeah. down here just didn't follow it, you know. Well, and that's something I think you and I, I mean, the three of us know, I mean, there's so many great players that have played in Canada that, you know, Americans just don't know about. And mm -hmm. that's, and that's what's great. What I love about your book, it adds to that, you know, that knowledge base in terms of who these players work. I mean, we all know, I mean, all of us grew up with the NFL, you know, we watch NFL network. Occasionally we'll get a little NFL history. We'll learn, you know, Don Hudson, I'll use kind of use him as kind of the benchmark or Red Grange, but mm -hmm. so many other great players that have played up there. In fact, on our very first podcast that we did, we talked about Blue Bomber history and it's just a fascinating conversation about, you know, the great players who none of us have ever heard about. Um, and that's what I loved about your book. And when I read your book too, I kind of, I was kind of, it reminded me of the movie uh, Leatherheads. I kind of, mm -hmm. I kind of got that feel. I mean, back, you know, obviously it's a fictional account, mm -hmm. but I kind of, I kind of put my, you know, I kind of used images from that movie as I was reading your book to get a sense and feel of what that time period was like. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's something that I think, you know, I think a lot of people lose, you know, people are more worried about the here and now in terms of TV ratings, follows and all that, but there's mm -hmm. just such a rich history that, to me, that's the best part of, of following the game of football, whether it be Canadian football or even Minnesota, like I use Viking history. Mm -hmm. um, and Viking history is relatively recent compared to, say, the rest of the league. And um, But back to the images, the stories, um, heck, even Bud Grant, you know, he's he, the living legend is still with us. Um, and every now and then he follows he follows me on Twitter, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> right but just to know you know it's like i explained had it you know like just how much history is out there that people don't know about and and i tried to include just all kinds of little details that sort of make the book fun to read and you know like the 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 fact that that the college called St. John's here in 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 uh, yeah. Minnesota broke off athletic relations with Concordia over over losing the game right so now we're not going to play you anymore um and then and then things like down in uh, at at morningside college uh in sioux, sioux city iowa the the referee suddenly stands there raises his hand and says time out and then falls down and dies on the field you know i just 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 these little amazing little stories along the way you know and i try to include those things and then like i said that whole side story that I have in there with Lionel Conacher and then the Montreal Mount Royals with their, basically we talk about the XFL, right? The original XFL being, being this uh, out, out um, this it's has its or origin in pro wrestling. Wow. They did that back in the thirties in Montreal. They brought all these pro wrestlers to play football for the Montreal Mount Royals. And, um, and depending on which newspapers accounts you read, they were kind of putting on a show, right? And yeah. so, and then, and then the team ends up coming down to the United States and sort of continuing it, and has a quarterback named the Mask Marvel uh, playing quarterback. And I suppose he, <laughs> you know, I suppose he has his 
he has his uh, oh what do you you know the 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 mask that they put on over their head right and right playing the, playing the game or whatever and it's just little details like that 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 I really enjoyed putting that stuff together because I felt like you know it's something where you can read the book and even if you're not interested in that particular college or that particular whatever there's going to be some bit of detail in there that's just going to make you chuckle or laugh because it's like oh wow wow that happened that's kind of funny so yeah well, the whole mass marvel as quarterback is fantastic i mean that's <laughs> that would work today you know you have yeah. someone to to take on some persona and then disguise themselves and they're behind center that's brilliant yeah. and the team called themselves what they were is they were these montreal mont royals and the the team was owned uh, by the um the guys that own the, the montreal canadians but they but they ended up sort of like disowning the team and sent them back to the United States. And then they continued to play in their Mount Royals uh, uniforms, which were reminiscent of the, the flag of Montreal. And, um, and they called themselves the bone crushers. And so you, so you have the bone crushers playing in these Montreal flag looking uniforms, and they've got the masked Marvel at quarterback. And then they're doing things at halftime, like it's snowing, so they're pretending like they're going to play wearing skis and snowshoes and stuff like. It's just crazy. Oh wow, wow! And it sounds like something just to you know bring it back to modern day. Something like you might see in fan controlled football on yeah. Twitch or <laughs> yeah. something like that. Which I, honestly, I'd probably tune in for. You know, at this point, um, sure. at this point in the season. And um, so, with that said, let me let me ask you: You got any other projects coming up here with foot that are football related? I think so. Um, I sort of feel like I need to take a break. And then right now I'm sort of <laughs> pr pr promoting the book, you know, the one that I've got out there. But um, basically there's the character in this book um, is it's the guy, the coach for Moorhead State. His name is uh, Alex uh, Sliv Nemzek. Uh, as it turns out, he's from a family of really good athletes. Uh, and I think there's a story there. So I, I might pursue okay. that. Um, I don't know, uh, that right now, that's possibly my next project for that. Right. Um, yeah. And, uh, with, and, you know, obviously your book just came out this yeah. past month, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard from anybody up North up in Winnipeg, like the Winnipeg blue bomber gift shop or any of those places who about uh, your book? Because. I, yeah, I haven't yet. Um, and I, I plan to actually contact them, but, and, and I'm actually, I'm planning to come out. Well, uh, I won't mention that, but there's the, the um, <laughs> I did get a call out on Twitter from Ed Tate, who is the um, senior um, writer and reporter for the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He, he posted on Twitter and said, hey, look at this beauty. I just got this in the mail today. Um, and I've, I've actually corresponded with him about different things and, and about the book. And he uh, was real happy to get his hands on this book. And um, Ed Tate, he's actually in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame as a, as a reporter. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so it was, I, I, that felt good to get a shout out from him. And, and um, what I, and I told him, I said, I guarantee you're going to learn something from this book right. because, you know, yes, you work for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and you've been around this stuff for a long time, but I just feel like I was able to scrown. I looked at 2300 sources of information yeah that's the one thing i did i did i i took a, a deep i took a look at all your certainly a lot i mean you put your heart and soul in here with and i looked at all those certainly that is you talk about a labor of love um and i love always looking at you know the research you know the you know you've got the written work but then you've got all the research and you know um so what was that process like in terms of how long was the research how long did it did you have to go anywhere special to like to the libraries or anything for this? Yeah, not, not, uh, I didn't have to do a whole lot of travel. Um, and I sort of was playing around with the idea for a while. So you, you could say I was working on it since 2018, but really I got serious about it this last March in okay. terms of, of really, um, diving into it. But, um, the research actually heavily involved, um, um, I would say about 65 to 70 percent of it was done online through two newspaper archive services. Okay. So, um, so I just paid, you know, paid for those services, and you know, you have to be good at looking for keywords. And, and was one of them newspapers.com? Yeah, and then there's also uh, I 
one of your sponsors or something, right? But there's another one out there, newspaperarchives.com. Okay. Yeah. Or, or newspaper newspaperarchive.com. And then, but then I also I had to ask for a lot of different microfilm. You know, I would right. Um, I, I'm fortunate in that in that um, I work at a university and so that I can use the library system at the university to right. get all what kind of materials I need through interlibrary loan. And a lot of yeah. that is through like the State Historical Society of North Dakota. And the one visit I did have to do was I went down to the Minnesota Historical Society and looked in their archives at their microfilm. So Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it's, I always ask about that because I'm a, I love libraries. And so when I hear you <laughs> tell stories about going to the library, I mean, when I was in college down in Western Illinois, I lived in the library for all the years I was there. So I always love, you know, I, I wish I could be you doing that research and just, you know, smelling those books and, you know, just, you know, doing just, I love, I love to research and write. Um, and I've done a lot of that, you know, in the academic side and other things. Um, and I know with, uh, with Scott, Scott, uh, you know, former newspaper writer, uh, sports writer. So he's done a lot of, he spent a lot of time in libraries too. Yeah. Well, and I got, I do need to mention that I'm really fortunate in that a lot of these colleges that I have information from, they do publish their student old student newspapers in an online digital archive, and you can go oh, okay. visit visit their library archives online, and and view their old newspapers. And so uh, I just was, you know, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, and I was able to do a whole lot of research without ever leaving my home so nice well that gives me hope you know for for my post-retirement plan after <laughs> uh after the full-time job is done and and hopefully maybe one of these days if i'm you know get you know i'd love to sit down and write a book about something in football not too sure what but um yeah. just get passionate about something that's what i you know for me it was that was the driver I don't know if you remember, but the dedication at the book, I, um, I just, my dedication is for the boys. Right. Uh, oh, and I, and I say, we're sorry it took so long to tell your story. Cause I really feel like I've gotten to know these guys and, yeah. and I really feel like I was doing it for them really. Cause yeah. you don't make good, you, you don't make much money when you write a book, you know, yeah. you, just, no, you do yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, you, you pretty much lose money when you write a book, right. You don't, yeah. you don't, you don't make any money, but I mean, yes, there are, there is a residual from, from each sale. Right. But you don't, but the idea is that you put a lot of time into it and, and, um, right. and I really, you really feel need to feel invested. And I really felt invested in this book. Like yeah. I really wanted to tell this story. And, you know, like, you know, probably like, like with, you know, you probably feel the same way. I know Scott and I have this conversation all the time, football history, um, doing, you know, simulation football, you, you're a stratomatic guy. It keeps us young. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. keeps us kind of in touch with with what you know that 12 year old uh, yeah. 10 to 12 year old in every one of us yeah. and um so when i saw you i saw that dedication I'm like that's really cool that is <laughs> really really cool so well listen we're gonna we're gonna um thank you for joining us and hang on at the on the opposite end of this we'll talk a little bit more offline um okay. after we stop recording but before we let you go where yep. can people um find your book Yep. Where can people find you on social media and how, you know, um, yeah. Tell us more. Sure. Um, well, the, the way, the best way, the, the book is on Amazon. So just look, right. look up border boys and then um, you, you should be able to find or you know, border boys, Winnipeg, you might find it that way or whatever, but anyways, it's called border boys. The best way to get to it though, is if you go to border boys, um, border boys, book.com will, will take you direct to the page this information a synopsis of the book but then there's also links to amazon and most importantly links to amazon canada right so that um if you're in canada you can uh, you can get uh, that rate and actually um i think just pricing wise just because of the pay the extended distribution cost in the United States is actually a little bit cheaper if you're in Canada. So you're actually you're actually getting a little bit of a deal if you're a Canadian and ordering from Canada. Okay. That so, makes sense. Yeah. And on social media, I know you said you're on Twitter. Where can people find you on Twitter? Um, well, I, I just, yeah, I just started a new account just so I could follow people more than post things, but it's border boys book is the handle at border okay. boys book. So, um, 
I, I, I tend to sort of hide on social media. I don't, <laughs> I know, I know that's counterintuitive to this world where you're trying to promote things and stuff like that. Right. Um, but, but there's a lot of evils with social media too. So I try to stay away from it. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's you... the smart play really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the way the world is. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny just even talking about that. I had a cat, you know, somehow I got into a thread and all of a sudden somebody brought in politics and I'm like, dude, this is about football. Let's keep politics out of this stuff. You know, we came here for football so we could get, get away from the other, the real, you know, the, the real world for just a little bit. So I get it. I get it. Ryan, did, did we lose you? I think he, Ryan froze up. Well, with that said, Hey, Scott, speaking for Scott and I, um, Thank you for joining us, everybody, and hopefully we will be talking to you and talking to you guys all again soon. And, uh, you know, it's been a long two months. Uh, really, it has been two months, I think, since we were last year, right, Scott? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's been a while. Yeah. So, it's a new and, year. So. Yeah, new year. So hopefully we will uh, Hopefully we will see you soon. I'm sorry, we will be. you'll be hearing from us soon. We, <laughs> you know, yeah, you and I both have smartly w chosen not to do uh, a YouTube channel, which I'm I'm very happy with. I... The whole YouTube doing everybody's got a YouTube channel. Like, yeah, no, we're not going to do a YouTube channel. Yeah, nobody wants like, to look at me. I don't nah, even like to look at nah, me. Nah, I like going old school. So, hey, with that said, everybody, hey, thank you very much for listening, and we will be talking to you, talking to you again soon. Bye bye. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. 
To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.